<clears throat> Matthew chapter 18, we're continuing our, continuing our study, uh, Follow Me. And that narrative that we've seen throughout the book of Matthew had misconceptions about the book of Matthew, but I think so far it's continuing in that same vein that Christ is showing his disciples what it means to follow him and what he will work in them as they do. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He doesn't say become a fisher of men to prove you're following me or, or show your following by fishing for men. He simply has the one charge, the one command, follow me. That's all we need to do. To be a right disciple is to follow Christ. <clears throat> In verse 1 of Matthew chapter 18, he begins a lesson that I think is 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 hard for all of us. And especially as disciples at such a time as this, we got to think of all of the great lessons that he's brought them through and to this point. He even brought a special group of disciples up to see his transfiguration or his his changing before them. He began to 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 rebuke them for their unbelief and to to show them faithfulness among the many other signs and miracles and and truths that he has taught them they come to this point where they realize something about themselves is lacking how do you follow christ what is what does that mean what does that look like and 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 verse 1 there of chapter 18 he begins to show them that they don't have as much figured out as they thought they did. Verse 1, Matthew chapter 18 says, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? One book over, look, let's look at Mark chapter 9 and see another take on this famous passage. At the same time as Jesus is transfigured before them, as Jesus heals a lunatic, as Jesus shows power of prayer and fasting, as Jesus shows their position in this world as strangers and pilgrims, they say, Christ, yes, but who is the greatest in your kingdom? Mark chapter 9, look with me in verse 33. Mark 9, verse 33, it says, And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, What was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. And so Christ comes to them and Straightforward ask them, what are you disputing? What are you talking about? What are you, what are you rambling on about? And immediately they know they were wrong, I believe. The Spirit of God convicting their soul. They held their peace. They become mute. They can't say a word. They say, ah, I know why he's asking that. By the way, they had disputed among themselves... Who should be the greatest? And so back in Matthew, they, they basically straightforward say it. Well, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Lord? Verse 35 of Mark chapter 9, it says, And he sat down and called the twelve, saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all, servant of all. You can go back to Matthew. <clears throat> the dispute arises. And they're doing it off to the side, thinking Jesus won't hear. He knows. He calls them on it. says, what are you disputing about? They come to him, and, and Matthew shows that plainly they say, well, well, Jesus, who is the greatest of all? Then he, Mark chapter 9 reveals to us, calls the twelve unto them and says, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. And back in Matthew, you see in verse 2, the next calling takes place, doesn't it? Jesus called a little child. So he prepares them, calls them out on their disputation, 
on their shameful discussion that they couldn't even say straight away plainly until Jesus provoked them. So he gathers them together and says, look, if you want to be great, you're going to be least. If you want to be great, you're going to be servant of all. And they're gathered together. They hear this and Jesus calls a little child, verse 2 of Matthew 18, called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. He called this child who immediately came. Again, look at that obedience. That doesn't show the spirit that wants to be great, that wants to be the leader, that wants to be in charge. That little child is called and that little child comes and that little child is set in the midst. Again, you want to be greatest, you better become least. You want to be greatest in Christ's kingdom, you're a servant of all. Now Jesus calls the child, the child comes. Do you come when Jesus calls? Do you do when Jesus calls? Are you what he intends of you when he calls? You must ask yourself. Here he calls this young child into the midst of a scenario that might have been uncomfortable. We don't, as, as well as most children don't, like to be called to the center of attention most times. Called before an audience, called in front of people. That might be embarrassing. That might be uncomfortable. There might be some concern as to why he's even brought forward. Nevertheless, this child is called and this child comes and is set by Jesus in the midst of this situation. This child didn't need to be bold. This child didn't need to be strong. This child didn't need to be versed. This child didn't need to be great. This child only needed to believe and look to who he was believing on. He looked to Christ. He stepped forward. And as that little child stood before Christ in the midst of a group of disciples that were wondering to himself, well, am I going to be a big shot? Am I going to be number one? Am I going to be head honcho in this kingdom? Jesus says, as this little child is, so ought you be. This child's not bold. This child only believes. And Jesus asks that we be the same. Verse 3, it says, And said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So again, keep your finger there, and you can go to Luke 18, Luke 18, which, which highlights this statement a little bit clearer, Luke 18. <clears throat> he says, except ye be converted, except ye change, except ye turn and become as a little children from whatever you are now, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Luke 18, if you would look in verse 16, it says, but Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. So he's talking about humility. He says of this child, as an illustration, that he receives the kingdom of heaven in such a spirit that there is no guile, there is no pride, there is no arrogancy. He's humble, he's needy, he's, he's weak. About as weak as they get, little children are, and impressionable. That's how we ought to receive the kingdom of God. And so back in Matthew... When he says in verse 3, chapter 18 and verse 3, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of God. He's saying if you don't receive the kingdom of God like a little child, you won't receive it at all. You have to be humble. You have to be needy. You have to be small in your own sight to be great in the kingdom of God, to even enter therein. He says you need to be converted. You need to change. You need to turn from what you are. Receive this kingdom as a little child. You need to be humble. And this is both a key in the reception of the kingdom of God. In other words, receiving 
the kingdom of God, salvation entering in. It's also, humility is also a key in ascension in the kingdom of God. You want to be great, be the least. You want to be, you want to be master and ruler, you have to be humble more than the rest. Servant of all, the Bible says. Least in your own sight. Now remember the same phrase comes through when Jesus says, Repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, Except ye be converted. Repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so this is a theme. Matthew chapter 3 John the Baptist comes out and says, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus enters into the ministry through the baptism of John and then goes and is tempted of the, of the, of the devil and Satan in the wilderness for that time. And he comes and enters into the ministry and immediately says, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He says, Receive this. Change. Be converted. Be humble. As a little child, enter into the kingdom of heaven. And now he's teaching his disciples so long after they were saved, that same truth. Some of the truths of scripture are timeless, aren't they? <laughs> Repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But I was saved. But, but I've already been saved. I've been saved for 10 years. Why do I need to repent and receive the kingdom of God? Because here the disciples are saved a couple years. They're walking with Christ. They're performing the works of the ministry. They're doing miracles. And Jesus says the same thing to them. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you do not receive this kingdom as a little child, you shall in no case enter in. You know this. Well, you want to be great in this kingdom? The same is true. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Receive it as a little child child <clears throat> you can go to psalm chapter 9 psalm chapter 9 keeping your finger in matthew chapter 18 just want to give us a few examples of humility and psalm chapter 9 is one of them <clears throat> psalm chapter 9 and in verse 7 psalm 9 and verse 7 it says but the lord shall endure forever are you glad for that he hath prepared his throne for judgment he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. In verse 9 it says, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Look at that care. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelt in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, in other words, when he starts to administer judgment upon those that are oppressing his people, it says, he remembereth them, he forgetteth not the cry of the humble. If you want your cry to not be forgotten before God, be humble before him. Psalm chapter 10 and verse 17. Psalm 10 and verse 17. <clears throat> Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. That will prepare their heart. That will cause thine ear to hear. To judge the fatherless and the oppressed. That the man of the earth may no more oppress. His judgment is toward the humble. He'll care for them as little children. He cares for them. Psalm 34. Look at Psalm 34. And in verse 1, Psalm 34 and verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. A, a, a wonderful way to be humble in the sight of God is to magnify him in your own sight and bring others along on that journey. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And therefore, be humble before him. The conclusion of the matter, and you can go to Matthew chapter 18 again. Matthew chapter 18, lest you think I'm stretching the scriptures, Christ gives it plainly. The disciples come to him and say, who's the greatest? And, they, and Jesus says, this little child in the midst. And except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So what he's trying to say is clear in verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child... The same is greatest in 
the kingdom of heaven. Conclusion of the whole matter, the humble are the greatest. Those that are small in their own sight. Those that are servant of all. The humble are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now regarding humility, you can go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4 in your New Testament. Timothy, Hebrews, James chapter 4. <clears throat> James chapter 4, I'll quickly start reading in verse 5. James 4 and verse 5, it says, Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? And what is that statement? Who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven? But a lust, but an envy, but a desire to be placed first, envious of those that would be equal with you or even greater than you perhaps? Do you think the scripture saith in vain the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? I don't believe that that scripture is actually quoted verbatim anywhere else in the Bible. But James here is drawing from the idea that that's a truth of the scriptures. That is a that is not quoted verbatim but that is an overarching truth is that the spirit that is in you lusteth to envy. It desireth to envy others. It is all it is jealous of Others, just by nature, that spirit in you. Verse 6, but he giveth more grace, and that's good. Because our spirit is always lusting to envy. Our spirit is always moving towards that tendency, and God gives more grace. Wherefore he saith, verse 6, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Do you want God to resist you? Well, then be proud. Look at verse 1. If you want God to resist you, look at verse 1 of chapter 4. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war and ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That is the proud there. That is the one that doesn't need God, and hence he will not ask, that wants more for himself, yet then he lusts and he desires to have, and he kills to get what he wants. He fights and he wars, and all of these things among the people of God at this time are the result of their own pride, their own selfish ambitions, their own desire to be greatest in the kingdom of God. That's why there's wars among you. That's why there's fightings among you. And this is what he's saying. Do you want God to resist you? And keep on fighting. Keep on warring. Keep on lusting. Keep on being full of yourself and proud. But I think everybody in this room doesn't want God to resist us, but rather wants God to give us more grace and give us more grace and work in our lives positively. And so we ought to be humble. But being humble is not something you can do, okay? Think of the person that's like, I am so humble. Think of the monk that, that strips himself of all worldly pleasures and, and, and whips himself in, in, in secret in order to be more humble. That's pride in and of itself. Being humble is not something you do, but being humble, I believe, is the natural effect of who's next to you. Remember the psalm said that, let us come together and exalt God. The more you exalt God, the more humble you are in your own sight because you see God is good. God is great. God is wonderful. God is almighty. God is excellent. God is perfect, glorious in majesty. God, 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 and me diminishing. Even as John the Baptist came forward and he said, he must increase, but I must decrease. That's the humble position and that just simply comes by nature of who you are next to and bring glory to but verse 7 it says and gives us more insight into how to get more grace and how to be humble and therefore how to be great in the kingdom of god verse 7 of james chapter 4 submit yourselves therefore to god in other words put yourself under god be servant of all Desire to be little in your sight and least in the kingdom. Submit yourself unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Verse 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh unto you. The devil's nowhere near God. So the closer you get 
in his presence, submitting under him, the further the devil is from you. You're resisting him simply by nature of who you are attaching yourself to. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Be humble in the sight of God, and he shall be the one that lifts you up and exalts you. And that's how you receive more grace. And that's how you appear humble in the sight of others, is when you're humble in the sight of God. If you turn to the right, you'll find 1 Peter. And 1 Peter talks more about this. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Look with me in verse 5. The second part of that, it says, For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. And there's a quote directly from James chapter 4. He says in verse 6, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. You want to be exalted? Be least. You want to be exalted? Be humble. You want to be exalted? Be servant of all. And who is all but God almighty? Serve him in humility of spirit. He will exalt you to be great in his kingdom and will bring glory unto you even as he brings glory unto himself. Verse 7 then, and this speaks to that childhood faith. This speaks to that being as a little child. When it says in verse 7, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. All your concerns, all your needs, all your desires, everything that you you need to have and your wants and, and, and your care, your worries, your concerns, cast it upon him. Why? Because he careth for you. And that's what little children do, isn't it? A little child knows nothing but the care of his father and his mother. He only wants what he wants. He follows them knowing that he can't get his own food, knowing that he can't provide his own shelter, knowing that he can't do anything, but all of his cares are upon his father. Even so, submit as a child unto your father, which is in heaven. Cast your cares as a little child upon him. Give everything up to him and be humble in his sight, and he will care for you. He will exalt you in due time. Continuing on in verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, if you just think of a lion walking the streets, you think of a a, a great ferocious lion with nails this long and and with with those teeth that, that can crunch and break bone, roaming the streets, when you think about that, what are you next to that thing, that creature, that beast that you can save yourself, sustain yourself, keep yourself, get away even from its, 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 its vicious attacks? That's what the adversary, the devil, is, as a roaring lion, as a hungry lion, as a lion seeking to devour, he roams about. We ought to be sober as a result. We ought to be vigilant as a result, but we also ought to cast our cares upon him. Follow him in humility as a little child. Follow him with the spirit that desires to be least in his sight, even as a little child is brought before those disciples. Verse 9, it says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Verse 10, But the God of all grace, who hath called us, unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. And so back in Matthew 18, you don't need to go there, but he said, except you be converted and be as little children, except you be humble, except you be servant of all, except you be low in your own sight, if you don't humble yourself as this little child, You'll never be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus calls the child unto him. Even as here in verse 10 of 2 Peter, he calls us unto him and unto his eternal glory. And he promises this, after you have suffered a while, after you have been humbled a little while, after you've gone through some struggles a little while, after you have faced the adversary a a little while, after you've followed Christ in all of his 
responsibilities and commands for you after you've gone through this thing and followed him as a little child he will make you perfect he'll make you established he will make you strengthened he will make you settled but again it all comes and stems from our willingness to be humble enough to just simply follow our Lord and when you're following God when you're following him you're not seeking to be greatest, are you? You're seeking that he would be exalted as the greatest. That the world would see that he is the greatest. And you're just simply next to him, following him, and seeking him. And his return unto you is he will exalt you in due time. He will make you perfect. He will establish you. He will strengthen you. And he will settle you. Jesus says, except ye be converted and become as little children, shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. He also says, whosoever shall therefore humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Really the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is Christ. <laughs> and that's what we all need to understand. We're just but children next to our Savior, next to our Father, next to our Lord. Serve Him, seek Him, follow Him, and He will make you perfect, established, strengthened, settled. He will make you fishers of men. Thank you, Father.